Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Liberty Report. With us today is Daniel McAdams, our co-host. Daniel, good to see you today. How are you this morning, Dr. Paul? Doing fine. Good. Special today, we have a special guest. Yeah, we haven't so, done that in a while. No, yeah. that's good. And she qualifies. She um, She's a journalist, but one that does journalism. Wow. <laughs> so, so this is very good. Her name is Julie Kelly, and we're delighted to have her on. Julie, welcome to the program. Dr. Paul Daniel, thank you so much for having me on. Good. Uh, Julie uh, writes for American Greatness, a yeah. publication, and right now she's been very active, one of the few, but yeah. she's, a, she's a energizing others to look into exactly what's going on legally with all those people who were going to take over the country and there was going to be a military insurrection and a coup and of course they arrested a lot of people. Well, the question raises from most decent people is, who they arrest? Who were the bad guys? How many bad guys were there? And she's interested in this subject, and she's written about it. I find it fascinating. So, Julie, we're really interested in knowing more about this. So tell us what motivated you to get on to this item and following through like you've had because you've written quite a few articles already. Yes, thank you for that. And thank you for bringing attention to what's happening to so many Americans right now. So I think my interest was peaked after following the Justice Department's uh, persecution, prosecution of Donald Trump and his close associates over the past four or five years. So I don't put anything past this Justice Department. And what we're now seeing, sadly, is an acceleration of the weaponization of the Justice Department against people they view as their political foes. And a lot of us who are writing about FISAgate, Russiagate warned that if this, these sort of investigations could be targeted against the sitting president and pow other powerful people, it was only a matter of time until the Justice Department started targeting regular Americans. And that's exactly what's happening in what they call the capital breach probe. So they've now arrested over 300 people across the country they've referred to this as a manhunt and that's exactly what they're doing most of the perpetrators as we could get into are nonviolent uh, offenders a lot of them were just there to protest the certification of the electoral college which is of course their constitutional right there were a handful of people there to cause trouble and they've been charged accordingly with assaulting police officers vandalizing government property stealing property and that's appropriate but what we're seeing is a political persecution against regular Americans who were justifiably also outraged about a lot of the illegalities and unlawfulness we saw uh, in the 2020 election. And so that's really what I've been covering now. You know, today is three months since the alleged uh, insurrection. So I've been really been looking into uh, what our Justice Department has been doing. Very good. Daniel. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it sounds something like out of the Soviet Union, right? Political yeah. persecution because of your political views. But, you know, I, I, Dr. Paul and I spent a, a long time up on Capitol Hill, and I immediately, Dr. Paul, when I saw it, I knew something was wrong, but I also knew that something was very fishy about this narrative, uh, you know, and uh, I, uh, I, I actually wondered at first, if because it, it's always the provocateurs who are the most violent, and I wondered about that. But, uh, you know, Julie, when I started reading what you wrote about a month or so ago, and it doesn't happen to me very often, but my jaw dropped because I couldn't believe it. I, 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 I had a sense that everything was, a lot of this was bogus, but my jaw dropped when I read one article that you, that you wrote, and I'm going to ask you to, to go over it with us. But this is the case of the Kua family, uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of it hits close to home. It's an 18-year-old homeschooled kid. Uh, they went there, they showed up, they went inside the Capitol, and go ahead and take up the story from there, Julie, because I think it's fascinating. If your jaw is dropping reading it, imagine what I'm doing as I'm going through these documents. I'm glad nobody can see what I'm saying or, <laughs> or screaming as I'm reading what our government and federal judges are doing. So this is the Kua family. Their son, Bruno, was arrested in Atlanta by the FBI on February 6th for participating in the uh, capital breach, as they call it. They charged him with all sorts of crimes. Uh, they detained him, sent him to jail in Oklahoma, um, where he was, where the government asked for him to stay in jail, uh, pretrial detention, which the government is asking for in dozens of cases, based on the fact, and this is for real, as Joe Biden would say, this is for real, 
the government argues because these people question the outcome, the, the legitimacy of the outcome of the 2020 election, whether Joe Biden was really honestly elected fair and square, they therefore don't believe in the laws of the United States and that makes them a security threat. So this is what they argued also in Bruna Kua's case. Uh, he lives on a farm, he's homeschooled, his parents have been married for more than 20 years, very stable environment. Um, but of course he was a Trump fan, which makes him a criminal in the eyes of the uh, democratically run Justice Department. So um, prosecutors argued not just against um, the charges that he faced, he did enter the Capitol. He had a small collapsible baton with him. He never used it. They called that a deadly and dangerous weapon. But what really was um, upsetting to read is that prosecutors said his parents he should not be released back into the uh, custody of his parents because he had been homeschooled and he quote unquote ingested his parents' political beliefs. The um, prosecutor and judge also scolded the father for taking their son to a stop the steel rally in Georgia after the election um, and really just verbally abused the parents for uh, taking their son to this rally and for homeschooling him and where they think he picked up all these nefarious uh, political beliefs. He finally was released after, I believe six or seven weeks in jail uh, after he got COVID, the judge finally took mercy on him and released him into the custody of his parents. She you know, the one other term that they use is that uh, they, they're guilty of uh, not accepting the uh, election. And they, they're suggesting that there are fraudulent votes out there and therefore they have a justification to uh, question the election. And I want to see if you could postulate a bit because I'm getting worried. I sort of share some of those views. Uh -oh. <laughs> and when, when, does it, when do I become endangered? Because uh, there has to be a line when somebody like myself, you know, I think there was probably fraud. I've been a victim of the fraud. Yes. I, I lost an election by 90 votes because of fraud. So I think it happens and there's a lot of history. So uh, just the fact that you question it, uh, and, and in this case, they add up a lot of other things, but that was really a big thing that they were talking about. Uh, he, he won't accept this, and he's disobedient, he's unconstitutional, you know, he's, he's committing trees and won't accept our government. But uh, is there a line, or is that part of our problem, that we have no idea where the line is on what he could say and do and what you and I might say and do? Well, that is the fear. I mean, um, you know, we saw this censorship before the election of anybody who was raising, including the president, raising, uh, you know, criticism about mail-in ballots. And he was censored by big tech. Other people were censored as well. If you raised any sort of question about how the COVID rules were going to impact, um, you know, all these absentee ballots that we saw flooding in, that somehow you were, it, you were, peddling disinformation. So we see this now apply, though, in court. Um, now, what's interesting is you're sort of seeing uh, a little bit of a turn. We had the D.C. Appellate Court uh, last week uh, actually overturn or ask a federal judge to reconsider keeping behind bars two people not charged with violent crimes, um, but that they simply did not argue, present enough evidence that these people were a threat. Well, of course, because they're not gonna be able to prove that they're a threat because they don't believe the outcome of the 2020 election. So they're building up all of these other offenses, but the judges are really starting to call uh, the government's bluff on this. But it, you know, and I've only gone through, I mean, I've gone through several cases, but you see this permeating, not just in the court documents, but in the media too, that we are criminalizing uh, political dissent. Also, Dr. Paul, I wonder what the statute of limitations is for not believing the legitimacy of, a, of an election. If that's a crime, then we need to arrest basically every journalist <laughs> oh, boy. in 2016 and every Democratic lawmaker and Hillary Clinton because we were told for four years that Donald Trump was not wow. uh, legitimately elected, that he uh, w was you know, helped by Vladimir Putin. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we should check the uh, statute of limitations on that. Yeah, exactly. That's the case. You know, the thing about uh, Bruno Kua, uh, you know, I, I had a, I have a 21-year-old, but he was 18 not long ago. And, 
you know, there was a, uh, he's not active online, but there is this braggadocio that young men uh, of that age have, and I think he did a little bit of bragging on uh, his uh, social media about how he was going to go down there and, and uh, occupy the Capitol and this sort of thing. Uh, and I think that was used against him. Uh, uh, I think you wrote that uh, U.S. Attorney Kimberly Pascal said, quote, he is a radicalized man with violent tendencies and no remorse for the violent insurrection. Sure. You know, and this, uh, Dr. Paul and I said at the time, you know, if we've seen coups that the U.S. has done overseas, if this was a violent insurrection, you know, you got another thing coming. But uh, it's, it's, it's just amazing the attack on the homeschool, the attack on, on, uh, on individual, uh, individuals, young people. But, you know, he sort of walked into a, into a trap by the, in, in a way. Um, he did. And it's interesting to note, I tweeted this yesterday, you know, all of these cases are being handled by the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. You have the same office that now is prosecuting a teenager for his political beliefs, also trying to find a plea deal for two juveniles who assaulted and then killed an Uber Eats driver a oh, few yeah. weeks ago. This is the same office. So they showed no mercy for an 18 year old Trump supporter, but now are doing everything that they can to make sure that these juveniles, these girls, uh, if that's what you want, uh, girls, I mean, they are 13 and 15, but still, um, you know, the dichotomy, and that's only one example, as you know, a, there are a lot of Americans who are really outraged at the handling of the January 6th investigation uh, versus what we saw over the summer from Black Lives Matter and Antifa. People recognize this double standard of justice. And I think that that also was part of the reason why I wanted to dive into exactly what was happening. You know, uh, Julie, in, in the newspapers and television, all there was some mention you know, of some right wing or conservative groups that were representative there. And of course, uh, the accuracy of the reporting had to be questioned. And you just mentioned the Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Is there evidence that any that they existed? And uh, is there an example of where it existed, but they were treated uh, definitely differently than the other groups? Not at that specific event. I know that there was the man, John Sullivan, who was tied to Black Lives Matter, um, who I believe was detained and released. But I'll give you just one example of the disparity in how Antifa uh, rioters and January 6th protesters are being handled. Uh, two men were arrested and charged with three counts of uh, possession and use of a deadly and uh, dangerous weapon, which was bear spray. These were the two men who allegedly sprayed Officer Sicknick uh, with bear spray. Mm -hmm. um, when that happened over the summer, and, Antifa, and Antifa uses a lot of bear spray, by, by the way, but I just yeah. found one specific case where an Antifa protester was charged with civil disorder for using bear spray against police officers. So right there, you see very clearly how those cases are being handled differently. And of course, we know the Department of Justice is uh, releasing all sorts of protesters in Portland. We saw Merrick Gartland try to explain why assaulting the Capitol or vandalizing the Capitol building was different than trying to destroy the Portland federal courthouse, it's different, he said, because Congress was in session on January 6th. And when Antifa tries to attack the federal courthouse, there's nobody in there. I mean, this is what we're hearing from top law enforcement officials in this country. Uh, it, it would be comical if it wasn't so terrifying. As you said, something we would hear about in the Soviet Union, not the United States. Yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, you, you wrote a piece on, about the, the big lie about Officer Sicknick, and this is really critical. And others have written about it, too. Glenn Greenwald had a great piece a few weeks ago about it. It seems to me the Sicknick issue is critical to the narrative because without that, there was no deadly insurrection because the others that died, I think someone had a heart attack and that sort of thing. This is critical. It's been proven completely wrong. The New York Times took this from anonymous sources, probably the FBI, and put it out. This is critical to the narrative, but as you write in your piece, and I'm going to ask you to expound on that, that fell apart very early, but still the mainstream media continues to perpetuate this lie that's critical to the narrative. 
Uh, it's just um, that is uh, a handful of us started pushing back on the Sicknick story right away. And uh, the New York Times finally was forced to retract that story on February 12th. Um, but it was too late because the New York Times story dated January 8th had already made its way into the House Democrats trial memorandum. Yeah. They specifically cite that article that's now been retracted. Now, I got an email yesterday from the DEC medical examiner's office. Within 90 days, you were supposed to release autopsy results and find the cause of death. She told me they can't yet because this case is so complex. Well, what does that mean? I mean, he's already been buried in Arlington National Cemetery now almost two months ago. So uh, it's not that it's complex, it's that it is exculpatory oh. to the whole narrative, as you said, about a deadly insurrection. So there's, a, I mean, would you trust anything even coming out of the DC medical examiner's office? No, uh, but the fact that here we are three months later, they still won't release anything. The family has lots of questions too. They still don't know what he died from. But it doesn't stop the media. And they did it over the weekend with the uh, killing of Officer Evans, uh, saying that he's the second Capitol Police officer to die in the line of duty. They just regurgitate this stuff. They're completely shameless. And as I point out, even outlets like the Wall Street Journal are repeating that lie and linking back to original pieces in January that still have in there the claim that he was murdered by a fire extinguisher, uh, which has been completely debunked. Our media is so hopelessly corrupt and dishonest. Um, it's no wonder you have half the country who's lost their minds and are completely brainwashed by anything these people say. Um, they're just, they're shameless and this is exactly what they're trying to do. You write about uh, the insurrection you know, falling apart. And uh, that isn't known, but is it uh, going to be a while before they recognize this and be helpful? Or uh, is it still going to be used like you've just indicated? They keep saying the same things over again, no matter what you, hey, you have. But I think that's uh, pretty good. There's a little, what, what I want to see and hear a positive thing, if you, if you can, that there is still a little bit of justice out there because just it's not 100% all criminals that are trying to, you know, impede us. So uh, that that to me means that uh, you you know we do here. There's a you know there is a judge here and there and uh, but you know after some of the things that have gone on in the last five years or so because I think the the hatred toward one man has driven uh, you know the, the politics and the judicial system. So um, I, I think there has to be a time. Otherwise, it, it's going to be hard to encourage people to stay in the fight. And I know that's what you're involved in, trying to get the truth out. And uh, that makes you a powerful person because truth is very powerful and it so scares us. So that's why we, we just love hearing uh, you're, you're talking about this issue. Well, thank you. I'm just really, Dr. Paul, trying to give voice to these people who are being persecuted, who no one is speaking up for, including the Republican Party, including honestly President Trump, who finally mentioned this investigation just a few weeks ago, but uh, in his defense, it would have been nice to hear from him sooner, um, but that was the first time we've heard a Republican leader speak about this uh, case. Look, these are not wealthy people. These are average Americans outraged at what they not just saw in the 2020 election, but whose president they defend, who they voted for and support, had been beaten down by the media, Democrats, and a lot of Republicans for several years. So this was sort of just a venting process for a lot of them. You know, a lot of these people, the Oath Keepers, for example, they're all military veterans. Um, and here they are being chased down by the FBI across the country, transported to Washington, D.C., being held without bail, their trials being delayed because the court system, of course, is so overwhelmed, which is exactly what the Justice Department wants. So every constitutional right that we have veterans who defended this country now are being completely violated and no one is speaking up for them. That's really my motivation here is to give uh, these people who are being wrongly prosecuted a little bit of a voice. Right. You know, it's interesting in your, in your piece that Dr. Paul mentioned about the insurrection probe falling apart. Uh, a, a sentence you had in there really caught my attention. You talked about Michael Sherman in this infamous interview he had on 60 Minutes where he said he authorized a shock and awe, a mass arrest of 100 people. And that really does sound like something out of the Soviet Union or a third world country. Uh, and that was just amazing to think that that's happening here. But if you would just take a couple of minutes, if you don't mind, 
and tell us a little bit about the story of Eric Munchel and his mother Lisa, uh, Lisa Eisenhout because she uh, this I think is critical and central to the falling apart of the of the of the narrative it is thank you Daniel for bringing that up because that was the case that the DC appellate court basically rebuked um, Eric Munchel as you uh, a lot of people will recall is the so-called zip tie guy even Michael Sherwin referred to him as the zip tie guy so he was the one photographed in the Senate gallery holding up uh, a a whole bunch of zip ties. Now, the original story we were told was that he brought, that people brought these zip ties in to try to arrest Mike Pence and drag lawmakers out, and make civil, uh, some kind of civil arrest, but that's not true. The Capitol Police apparently left stashes of these zip ties around the building. Just so happened a photographer was there to take a picture of him as he held up the zip ties. Another interesting little angle there. But anyway, he and his mother, Lisa, traveled from D.C. to Washington to uh, listen to the president's speech and be involved in the protest. They were immediately identified by law enforcement. They were interviewed. They both turned themselves in to law enforcement. This was roughly January 20th, or excuse me, January 12th. They were transported from D.C., from Tennessee to Washington, D.C., where, as I said, they were held without bond. Um, but they committed no violent crime. They have not been charged with any weapons violation. They didn't assault police. In fact, they actually were trying to help law enforcement. Um, they left. Uh, they didn't vandalize any property. They did really nothing wrong except sort of be in a place where they shouldn't have. Um, but they don't face any sort of violent uh, charges. And so when they, the prosecutors and the judge signed off on their pretrial detention, this was the DC appellate court who came in and said, not only did they not prove their case against uh, Eric Munchell and his mother, Lisa, um, but they should immediately be released pending trial. And once that got kicked back to the federal judge, uh, the government withdrew their motion to uh, keep them behind bars, where they had already sat, though, for two and a half months. Wow. Wonderful. A little bit of good news. Yeah. Uh, uh, Julie, we're going to be finishing up here, but I want to make sure our viewers know how to reach you or read your material quickly. Do you have a website, a web page where they can go to and keep up with your activities? Thank you so much. So I write for American Greatness. The website is amgreatness.com. Um, and so you can find all of my work there. I'm also on Twitter a lot. Julie underscore Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y with the number two. Um, and so that's where you can keep updated on, uh, you know, my work and then following other journalists work who are following the court cases pretty closely. Julie, this has been wonderful. I'm Thank very you. happy that you were able to come on our program because you're exactly the kind of people that we like to get on here because we're looking for the real truth of what's happening. But it's such a sad situation in spite of all the negatives that have gone on really in the last 10 years. A lot of people ask me, you know, how, how are things, uh, you know, uh, up in Washington, how did you endure? And I say, you know, even I've been out of not quite 10 years and uh, things have gotten a lot worse up there the way I see it. Uh, so it, it is a mess, but I still have met most of the people I have met over the years, politically, in medicine, neighborhoods, everything, are really very decent people. So it's, it's not just a numbers game, but it's a quality game. And that's why it's very important that people like you are out there and you're getting the publications, you'll do the work and you get the credibility and you get the reputation for saying, you know, I'm seeking the truth. We might never declare, matter of fact, we have, uh, we have our disclaimer. We don't pretend to know everything, but we have certain principles that we follow. And uh, that of course is promoting peace and prosperity. And that means, uh, you know, a good judicial system and a, a wise policy at the national level when it comes to finances. So that's why we're delighted to have people like you on. I wanna thank you one more time for being with us today. Thank you so much for bringing attention to this. I really appreciate it. And to our viewers, please come back soon to the Liberty Report.